that again. God is good. And all the time. Amen, amen. You guys can have a seat. Tonight we have a shorter service prepared for you. Um, We have quite a bit of hefty announcements for after service. So, um, you know, we decided to have a shorter service tonight. Um, So we've been talking about Paul, the Apostle of Christ, and, you know, about the road to Damascus and that uh, just a phenomenal, amazing, powerful conversion that he uh, went through when he encountered Christ on the road to Damascus, you know, and on that road to Damascus where he was uh, having in plan a letter from the high priest um, to arrest followers of Christ. And so he was, uh, he was on the way to Damascus to, to persecute Christians, and instead he met Christ on that road. Um, and then we talked about going into the wilderness and digging deeper into our relationship with God. Um, this past Sunday night I spoke about uh, the uh, Paul's uh, shipwreck on the way to uh, Rome when they, were, they had to go around Crete and they were shipwrecked over there. And how God in every storm has a way out for us, whether it's here on earth or in heaven, he has a, a plan for us. Tonight I want to talk about some of these battles, but I want to talk about a deeper battle and a battle that, you know, some of us may not understand is a real thing. Others, we know a lot of it. Others misunderstand it completely. And I'm not going to go deep into what the battle means, but I want to talk about preparing for this battle. I want to talk about spiritual battles, and I've heard many situations of spiritual warfare you know we've called i've heard um you know failing a class is spiritual warfare no you just didn't study you just didn't prepare that's not spiritual warfare that's laziness there's other times where there is spiritual warfare i've heard um actually this past winter fest one of the worship teams they were there and they were talking i was talking to them um, a team from out of state, and, and they were telling me, they were like, man, I had a crazy type of spiritual warfare this past weekend. They are like, the whole team. We had, like, unrest the whole weekend up until we were singing, like, talking about sleep deprivation. We could not sleep. We could not, you know, we just didn't feel at peace because we were about to serve God in such a powerful way in worship. That's spiritual warfare. So there's a difference. Sometimes there's these battles that we bring ourselves into. And that's, again, stuff like our laziness or maybe our own pride or just different things that are poor decision making. That's from us. But then there's the spiritual warfare that is brought on. And and usually, a lot of times, it is in a way to distract us from what God is about to do. Or sometimes it's to distract us from what God has done. Um, I remember several years ago, I want to say probably 2014, 15, something like that, um, we had an extremely powerful year at camp. It was an extremely powerful uh, week of camp. And I remember on the way back, um, we were texting in a group chat, the staff, and we were talking about how so many of us, like, we're like, man, I, I just almost got into an accident. Oh, I just did too. Oh, my kid just got sick. Oh, I just had an issue at work, right? Like, we all just in that, we had camp like just three hours away. And in three hours, the way the, the devil, the enemy was attacking us to distract us from what God has just done that week. Satan is working. He works 24-7. And he's working to distract us from what God has in plan or what God has already done in us. And so we need to prepare for a battle. We need to prepare for it. It's not that uh, there will be a battle. There is a battle and we are in it. And Paul 
is writing to the church in Ephesus in chapter 6 in the book of Ephesians. He's talking to the church in Ephesus and he just talked about some great things, some, some beautiful things in our walk with Christ in, uh, to the church in Ephesus. Uh, then he begins with uh, a call. And this is a call to be prepared for battle. And we'll be reading in Ephesians chapter 6, starting from verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, starting from verse 10. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So here we see two steps, two things that we need to do. Two things that we need to do. The first thing, we need to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. In some versions, it says the power of his might. And then the second thing is, put on the whole armor of God. And why? That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. See, a lot of times, we try to skip that first step of standing in the power, in the strength, power, of the Lord's might. And we skip it all the way to let's put on the armor of God. Remember, we talked about this in Sunday school. If you, if you grew up in Sunday school, you remember, you know, coloring the shield, and then coloring the sword, coloring the belt, and the breastplate, you know, of righteousness. And, and it was all fun, but now let's look at it in its real application. He says to stand in the power of his might. This is the training. Because what's the point of putting on the armor of God? What's the point of putting on that whole armor, everything that we're about to go into, if you are not trusting in the Lord's might? It's like handing a soldier a gun, but not teaching him how to shoot. It's... It's putting on this armor, giving all this weaponry without saying how to use it, without understanding the power of it. And we're going to go into what each piece in the armor means and, and why it's there. And to understand that, you first need to understand that there is power in his might. There's a difference between strength and might. A difference between, again, if you're reading in a different version, instead of strength, it's going to be power. There's a difference between power and might. You see, might is the, uh, the, there is a strength. You see that there is, there is that, uh, uh, you know, it's like Andrew here. You know, he looks muscular. You know, he looks muscular. He looks athletic. He really isn't, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's might, where it shows. But then the power, the strength in his might is Andrew actually power cleaning. What do you power clean? 805, you know, that's, <laughs> that's the strength, that's the power in his might. It's proving the might. It's proving his strength. And so that's why it's important to understand the Lord's strength, the Lord's power in his might. And then it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And then going to verse 12, it says, for we do not wrestle so we do not wrestle. This is talking about in the present tense. Again, it's not you are going to wrestle. You are not going to wrestle. Or it will happen. It won't happen. It's talking that we are in spiritual warfare. Whether you acknowledge it or not. Whether you are prepared or not. We are in spiritual warfare. And it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But against the rulers. Against the authorities. Against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places it doesn't matter the the type of spirit you're battling it doesn't matter you know what you're battling spiritually the point is is we're battling spirits oftentimes and and Andrew and I have dealt with this so many times in the past working together in ministry for a while we've dealt with times where we're just Sometimes we're, we have some beef in between each other, right before a service or right before something, we're about to do something. And a lot of times now, <laughs> we've learned to, to just stop and, and take a step back. And hey, this is, this is the devil getting in between us to distract us from what God is about to do. 
We need to acknowledge the spiritual warfare that is going on around us. We need to acknowledge that there is a battle to fight for your attention. There is a battle to fight for, for your life. This is a salvation issue. This is a life and death issue. I don't want to scare you too much. But this is spiritual warfare. And there is constantly, constantly, constantly battles around us. Whether we believe it or not, whether you want to think about it or not, even the distraction to be on your phone. Sometimes, sometimes you'll get that perfect text message right, at the, right in that moment. Right when you might be hearing a word from God. And it's so, easily to be, it's so easy to be distracted and look away. To get distracted from what God is about to say. Or how he's about to work in your life. Remember, the devil is what? The scripture describes him as crafty. He is crafty. He is mischievous. He is constantly scheming and planning. We look in, in um, I was reading earlier today, I believe it's Acts chapter 16 with Paul and Silas. When, they're, when um, they meet the, uh, the servant girl that, that is dem demonically possessed. And what happens? She starts shouting who they are. She's revealing the truth that they are of the Lord Most High. And what happens from then? They start getting exposed and they start getting attacked. You see, there was a way for, for a, a, a spirit to use a situation that, that shouldn't have happened. They reveal things. He, they, but they are they're, they're beings. They're not gods. They can't read your mind. So I wouldn't be so stressed here. But I'm saying... That there's a spiritual warfare to distract you, to take your attention. And it could be as easily as a friend whispering in your ear. The next verse. Verse 13, it says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the, in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. So we remember that this is the, the first piece of armor that is always brought up. Now we got to remember where Paul is. Paul is in a prison cell. And so what I imagine is he's looking at a Roman soldier. And he's looking at the armor. And he sees this belt. And a belt technically isn't an armor. It's not a part of armor. But it's an important piece. It holds everything together. And you see the belt of truth. It, res it, it resembles our biblical beliefs. All the beliefs that we believe, the truth that we believe in Scripture. This is what it's holding. All, all that we believe as Christians as a whole, what, what we call the faith. Now this is part of the armor that we have to have. And it's a foundation to live upon all the time. And we need to understand and have confidence in these basic doctrines of our faith. The next thing that he says to have and I want you to pay attention to that word have, by the way. In verse 14, it says, Having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. You see, a lot of times we rely on our own righteousness. We rely on our own selves. But you know what? What does Romans say? That no one is righteous. No, not one. And so for us to rely on our, on our own righteousness is pointless. It's foolish. Because it's not enough to cover this spiritual warfare. It's not enough to protect us from the spiritual warfare that we're going to. And so we must be covered in righteousness, in Christ's righteousness. And so he's saying, put on the breastplate of righteousness. It's a protection from Christ, his righteousness that covers us. And this righteousness is received by grace and faith in Christ. The next thing in verse 15. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Preparation. It's a word meaning, meaning to, to uh, it, it's like a prepared foundation. This truth that we hold, the truth in scripture, the truth the, of the gospel that it provides the footing for everything we do. It is the foundation. It is, it is, it is the powerful um, 
uh, all of our body, it rests on our foundation, on the feet, on the shoes. And he's saying to put on these shoes, the shoes of the gospel of peace. This is what we are running on. This is what we are walking on, what we are treading on, the gospel. And we must be prepared. We must, um, we must be ready to, to, we need to have a constant readiness to share this gospel. The next thing says, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, and then in verse 16, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. And I want to, us to hear this word, take. So before it was saying have, have the belt of truth, have the breastplate of righteousness, have the shoes of the gospel of peace. And now it's take. So these are things that we must have, and that comes on first. Those are the important foundations of our faith. Those are the important foundations of our armor, of how we must prepare for spiritual warfare. And now it says take. And it says to take on the, sh the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now it protects us from the attacks of the enemy. And what does the devil do? The devil discourages and maybe in our feelings, in our fears, and lies. And all these can be thrown at us. They're hurled at us. And if we have that shield of, of faith, the shield, the shield of faith to protect us, that we have faith in God, faith in him and his salvation and who he is, that he will protect us from these lies, from these uh, fears, from these uh, discouragements. And then the next thing. In verse, I'm sorry, in verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. You see, oftentimes, you know, again, the devil's attacks are in discouragement. And this helmet of salvation can also be looked at as the hope in salvation. And when we put on this hope of salvation, we are confident that we are saved. That we are saved through our faith in Christ. And when we have this, this, this helmet of salvation, this hope of salvation, when the devil will come to you and attack you with these kind of thoughts. For me, for example, when I first got baptized. So you know they give you a while to sign up for the baptism. I signed up the week before. And I was uh, 14. And so uh, during the uh, pastoral interviews, I kept getting asked, are you sure? Don't you think you're a little young? And they meant well in asking those questions. I'm not judging them and I'm not blaming them for asking those questions. But after my baptism, that kept popping up in my head. Was I too young? Maybe I shouldn't have gotten baptized. Maybe I wasn't ready yet. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. I don't think I did it right. I think uh, I, I, shouldn't, I, I should have waited. I should have listened to them and said, maybe, maybe, maybe wait until next year. Maybe wait until the year after. Maybe wait until, quote, unquote, I'm ready. And there was a big attack for me constantly. And I remember breaking down in front of one of my mentors, crying to him and asking, did I get baptized way too early? We need to put on the hope of, of our salvation, that we are saved in our faith in Christ. We are saved through the grace that Christ offers us. That we can be righteous in, in his sight. Putting on that breastplate of righteousness. And it's an assurance that God will triumph. The next thing, it's still in that same verse, I believe, verse uh, 17. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we need to first understand that the word of God is the inspired word. That it is the inspired word of God. If we don't understand what this book truly means, if we don't understand that this book is the inspired word of God, then it has no power. Not only did the spirit give us the scriptures, but also he makes them alive to us. And he equips us with the right uh, uh, strategies, the right 
ways to, to use this scripture in our lives. And we look at it, for example, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, how he fought the devil, how he fought the enemy, how he fought Satan with what? With scripture. Because the scripture is the sword of the word of God. I want us to stand up. You see, Paul, he calls us to be prepared um, because we are in warfare. And in warfare, you got to be bold. You have to, have to be bold. You have to be bold in warfare. Because, I'm sorry to say it, cowards will not be in heaven. Cowards will not be in heaven. When we step in faith, when you step in faith and trusting in who God is, accepting him into your heart, calling him into your heart, and, and giving your life to Christ, that takes courage. That takes courage. That takes boldness. And I talked about Paul and Silas earlier. And again, I believe it was in Acts chapter 16. And I love when they're arrested. That moment when they're arrested. And they're sitting there in the prison cells and it says that they started worshiping God. That they started worshiping God. And it reminded me of this story in, um, I believe it was in 2014. It was a nine-year-old boy who was kidnapped. He was kidnapped and and drove around for three hours. And for three hours, this nine-year-old boy, you know what he did? He sang. He sang that song, Every Praise, by Hezekiah Walker. So imagine, for three hours straight, he was, every praise is to our God. And he's just going that, going, going and singing, singing, singing. For three hours straight, you know what happens after three hours? The kidnapper, he pulls to the side of the road and he pushes the kid out of the car. What an awesome thing. What an awesome story, an awesome testimony. Because when he was in that moment of a mess, when he was in that moment of warfare, when he was in that moment of trouble, what did he do? He called upon the Lord. And Paul and Silas, what did they do? They called upon the Lord. And you know what happens? Their, start, their chains started to break. Everyone in the prison cell, there was a roaring thunder, a, 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 a powerful tremble. And their chains broke. And the prison guard, he gets ready to kill himself because he's terrified that all the prisoners escaped. And you know what Paul says? He says, don't do it. Don't harm yourself. Don't do it. We're all here. And the prison guard falls to his knees and says, what can I do to be saved? And he gives his life in that moment. You see, boldness is required. And it's this boldness to call upon the Lord. It's this boldness to step out in faith. It is this boldness to, to do what is, what is maybe seen as awkward, as weird, as maybe you be ostracized and, and, and called names. That's okay. Christ was called names too. He was called demonic. He was called all kinds of things. He was called crazy. He was called a liar. He was spit on. And there's one bold thing that you can do tonight. The first bold thing you can do tonight would be to give your life to Christ. If you haven't already, if you haven't came before God and said, God, I, I am a sinner. I have fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of my sin, of my failures, is death. And as in Romans, it says it. Paul says it. He says what? He says, no one is righteous, no, not one. I'm not righteous. I'm not enough. But you are. And tonight I ask that you come into my life, that you transform me, that you give me a new creation, a new life in you. Tonight I step forward in boldness. And I'm not talking about an altar call. We're not going to do that tonight. But I want you where you're at, if you haven't given your life to Christ, if you haven't done that bold step, do it. What are you waiting for? Your friends might mock you, but I pray that they'll follow you. And if they don't, sometimes we're going to have loss in this life. We're not guaranteed all our possessions. We're not guaranteed everything are guaranteed a place in the presence of God if you give your life to Christ.
tonight I encourage you to do that. We're not going to do an altar call where you're at. If you have any questions, any prayers, sure, talk to me. But we're not going to do an altar call, but where you're at, come before God. Step boldly in the presence of God.